Good morning, and welcome to our time of worship on this, the final Sunday in March in 2020. It's hard to uh, believe that in just a week it will already be Palm Sunday and that the week after that we'll be making our way toward Good Friday uh, and the celebration of Easter. And as uh, we gather together in God's place uh, at this time, we continue to do so at, at probably the strangest time that I have ever experienced in my life or lived through, and, and maybe that's the same for you as well. Uh, well, here at home, we're making the best of it as we try to get our kids to focus on their school, but also take enough time for rest uh, and for play and for just helping out around the house. And uh, maybe like you, it has its ups and downs, uh, but overall, we're doing well, and I hope that you are well too. Well, like many of you, I've been keeping up by reading or watching the news on a regular basis. And on CBC's The National, the anchor has been reporting from her home for most of the week. And as she signs on, she says something like this. Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenal, and I'm reporting to you tonight from my back deck. Well, I thought maybe as your pastor I should offer a similar kind of introduction. Well, good morning, I'm Dan Hoagland, and today I'm leading worship from my living room. Well, this morning, I'm bringing you news as well. Uh, the good news of the gospel that reminds us that God continues to watch over us and to watch over our world. And Psalm 24 invites us into God's presence with these words. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. We are confident that God is with us as we gather in his presence today. And he reminds us of his presence and he greets us with these familiar words. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, this time we're going to join together in song, and uh, we're thankful that Pat is again able to lead us in worship, and we're going to sing together, uh, Amen, because he lives. the past. 
Good morning, boys and girls. It's so good to see you. I've got uh, uh, David and Isaac and William here with me, and we're coming to you from our back deck. And so uh, it's a beautiful day uh, in New Brunswick today. Uh, lots of sunshine. The sun is beginning to feel warm. And before we get into the message this morning, there's just a couple of things that I wanted to mention. Uh, the first thing is I wanted to wish a happy birthday to a couple of you. I know that Lily, you had your birthday, I think a couple of weeks ago already. We hope you had a wonderful day. Uh, also to Gwen, you celebrated your birthday maybe 10 days or so ago, and we're so glad. Now, I want you to be really quiet for a minute and to listen carefully and tell me what you can hear in the silence. Okay, well I'm going to ask the boys, what do you guys hear right now in the silence? The wind. wind. Do you hear the wind? Okay, how about you? Anything? Birds calling. You hear birds calling? Yeah. yeah I, I hear yep. streams. Streams, yeah. I hear ice melting, all sorts of things. Now, if you hand me the hammer and hand me the nail here, listen to the sound that I'm going to make now. What does that sound remind you of? Yeah, William? Nails banging against wood. Nails banging against wood, okay. Jesus dying on the cross. Jesus dying on the cross, yeah. So those sounds really kind of remind us um, of the fact that Jesus died. And I think one of, one of the wonderful things about the story is even though we hear those sounds, and I think in a way we think to ourselves, oh, it's so awful to imagine him suffering uh, and dying, uh, that these are actually... Um, that these sounds actually remind us of the fact that Jesus offered himself up to death on the cross and that in doing so he also draws us to himself and he promises us the life that we have in him. So let's give thanks for that this morning, okay? We'll turn to him and let's pray, okay? Close our eyes, fold our hands. Lord, we thank you so much that you have draw, drawn us to yourself uh, in the cross, that it's a lot like a, a magnet that pulls something metal towards it that even though it's a, a terrible thing to witness, that we imagine the sounds and the sights of it. And yet we know that in this, we experience your love and your care for us. And we thank you. And thank you for these boys and girls and bless them in their day today. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, blessing. So we'll do it together. We know they're gonna respond to us. So we'll say it together, ready? The, the Lord, Lord be with you. you. And also with you. Well, before we come to God in prayer this morning, I just wanna remind you of uh, the need to uh, continue to support uh, the budget of our church uh, by giving uh, as you're able to give. Um, I, I also noticed too in the memo that came out this week that we have a, a special offering today and it's for the Ministry of World Renew and, and particularly for refugees. And I think as the COVID-19 crisis continues to manifest itself in places all over the world, I think that one of the areas of, of special concern are refugee communities. I think of, of some of the camps in places like Syria and the way that uh, this could cause serious health uh, issues uh, and, and some real tragedies that have the potential to unfold there. So let's give as God has blessed us to give. Uh, of course, if you are struggling financially, I know that people have uh, either had to scale back on their work or maybe aren't able to work at all. By all means, please uh, contact uh, the deacons and uh, connect with them, and I'm sure that they will do their best to support you uh, during this time. Uh, as we come to God in prayer, we're also going to pray together the words of the Lord's Prayer. And so they, unlike other times, I don't think they're going to be up on the screen unless uh, uh, through the, the magic of technology that happens uh, beyond this recording that I'm doing. Um, but let's uh, turn to God in prayer at this time. The Father in heaven, we gather in your presence together this morning 
from many different places around the city of Fredericton and beyond. And yet we give thanks that we are one body joined together, not just through family relationships or physical proximity, but in Christ and by the Holy Spirit. We give thanks for this season of Lent, a Lent that we will never forget for as long as we live because of the remarkable circumstances that we find ourselves in. And as we continue to make our way toward the cross and the empty tomb, help us to anchor ourselves in the good news of Jesus who died, rose, and now reigns with you in glory. We give thanks and pray for the world. We see your faithfulness in the regeneration of creation, in the sunshine that keeps growing warmer, in the sap running in maple trees, in the snow as it slowly melts and subsides, in the buds on the trees that grow a little plumper each day. We give thanks for those who work in agriculture, especially at this time of the year when many are busy preparing for a new planting season, that you would bless their work. We also give thanks for those who continue to work hard to keep food and necessary supplies stocked in local grocery stores. We give thanks for the gift of technology that enables us to stay in touch with, with each other even as we spend time apart. We pray for your world at a time when entire countries are shutting down and economies are grinding to a halt, a time when we are reminded of our frailty, but also of our need for your care. And we pray for nations especially hard hit by COVID-19. We pray for Italy and Spain, that its people and leaders would sense your presence in the midst of devastating loss and death. We pray for the United States, especially those parts of the country that are struggling right now. We pray in particular for the poor, for those who are refugees, and for those who have limited access to medical care that those with resources would remember and provide care to those without. We pray for Canada, asking that you would keep this nation in your care, but also open our eyes to see you and to turn our hearts toward you. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones due to this virus in places around the world, that they would experience your peace and comfort in their lives, O oh God. And continue to be near to those who are on the front lines and responding to this pandemic. Healthcare workers, first responders, essential service providers, journalists, journalists and government uh, officials, that you would protect and reassure them. Well, with the psalmist, we acknowledge those things that harm our relationship with you and with one another. And we pray, have mercy on us, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out our transgressions. We acknowledge that our hearts are so often out of tune with your will for us, and we ask for you to forgive our sins. Enthrone in our hearts, Jesus Christ, King of the universe, Savior and Lord. We give thanks for this fellowship of believers. We thank you that Mark Van Ord could return safely home to his family in the Netherlands this past week. We pray for your continued care in the Venord family as Martin faces ongoing health challenges that he and his loved ones would experience your love and strength. We pray for your care in the life of Robert Drost and we acknowledge our fears about his well-being during this time as he struggles in his health and waits for your provision. And grant him, Michelle and his family, your peace and care. Give strength to Harry and Henny and Pat and Ashley and the extended family as they provide support from afar. We pray for Petra Van Woodenberg as she continues to undergo treatment, that she would sense God's presence and healing. And Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our well, scripture reading today is from Revelation chapter 3. We've been making our way through the letters to the seven churches. And this letter is written to the church in Philadelphia. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds, 
See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And we give thanks to God for his word to us today. Brothers and sisters, in his autobiography, Billy Graham describes an encounter he had with, uh, in 1963 with President John F. Kennedy. The two men connected briefly at the National Prayer Breakfast. Well, I had the flu, exp explains Graham, and after I gave my short talk and he gave his, we walked out of the hotel together toward his car. And at the curb, he turned to me and he said, Billy, could you ride with me back to the White House? I'd like to see you for a minute. Mr. President, I've got a fever, Graham protested. Not only am I weak, but I don't want to give you this thing. Couldn't we wait and talk some other time? Well, of course, the president said graciously. But as it turns out, the two would never meet again. Later that year, Kennedy was assassinated. And as life went on for Billy Graham, he couldn't help but reflect back on his missed opportunity. Well, his request haunts me still, Graham said. What was on his mind? Should I have gone with him? Well, it's doubtful that any of us will ever have presidents or prime ministers confide in us about the deeper questions of faith. And yet God provides each of us with specific opportunities to respond to his calling in our lives. Well, our reading from Revelation asks us to consider what it looks like for us to be faithful in walking through the open doors that Jesus presents to us. Well, this morning we turn our attention to the letter written to the church in Philadelphia. It was founded 140 years before the birth of Jesus. It was ruled by King Attalus II. But the king wasn't out to build just another military outpost. King Attalus had discovered and he had fallen in love with Greek language and culture. The Greek culture valued many of the same standards that we consider important today. Things like democracy, equality under the law, medicine, science, arts, and athletics. And as the king embraced these values, it led to a deep personal transformation. Why, the king even changed his name. And he took on a, a new Greek name, Philadelphus. And Philadelphus literally means brother loving. Well, this is the kind of ethos that he hoped to establish in the new city that he was constructing. And so he named it after himself, and he called it Philadelphia. And it was to be a cultural hub for all things Greek, for language, for learning, and for lifestyle. And his goal was to proclaim to the whole world the good news of the Greek way of life, that in a sense, Philadelphia was a missionary outpost for all things Greek. Well, the king's bold initiative pays off. When Philadelphia was first established as a city, its main language was Lydian. But over the years, that slowly began to change. And by the time that Jesus writes a letter to the church there, everybody was speaking and writing Greek. Well, the city itself had a stable economy it was based on industry and agriculture. The soil around the city 
uh, was especially fertile, and, and that's because Philadelphia was on the edge of a highly volcanic region. But this also meant that the city faced the threat of seismic activity. In the year 17 AD, long after King Attalus was dead, the city was severely damaged by a massive earthquake. And many of its defensive walls crumbled. Its residents grew fearful. Some left the city altogether. They pitched lightweight huts outside of the city walls, which at that point were broken down. And those who remained tried to build things back in such a way that even if a, another quake were to strike, that it would be able to withstand it. But William Ramsey explains that the memory of that disaster lived long. Its people lived in dread always of a new disaster. Well, today as an entire world, we are facing our own disaster and there's so much fear in the world right now, not unlike the fear that many of the residents of Philadelphia experienced in the aftermath of this destructive earthquake. And by the time that Jesus writes a letter to the church there, that many were still camped outside of the crumbled walls in semi-permanent dwellings. That the city of brotherly love had become a place of constant fear that the end was soon near. And it wasn't just the average resident of the city who faced special challenges. Believers living in the city bore a special burden because of their commitment to following Jesus. Scott Daniels suggests that there were three specific challenges that believers there faced. He says that the first challenge they faced was a lack of power. Jesus acknowledges in verse 8 of our scripture reading, I know that you have little strength. And of the congregations that Jesus writes to, most agree that this one was the smallest in size. There were just a few members. They had limited resources. They lived at a time when everybody was on the edge. Nobody knew when disaster was going to strike again. So how does the church respond, despite the pressure that they faced all around them? Well, Jesus commends them. You have kept my word, and you have not denied my name. As we experience ourselves a similar kind of fear all around us today, what does it look like for us to keep God's word and to proclaim his name? Well, how is what's happening in the world an opportunity for us to be faithful in the way that we live out our faith. The well, second challenge faced by this small congregation was its expulsion from the local synagogue. Philadelphia had a large Jewish population and in the early days of the church it was common for Jews who had accepted Christ to continue to worship there in the synagogue. And this would also have been true for Christians who were living in Philadelphia. And for a time, there was relative harmony between Jews and between Jewish Christians. But then Greek Gentiles began to accept the faith. And this caused tension in the synagogue, and suddenly Christians were no longer welcome there. And this seems to be what Jesus is referring to in verse 9, when he says that I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan Come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. That Jesus is in no way condemning all of the Jews in Philadelphia. But he highlights that there were some in particular who pushed hard to keep the Christians out. As believers today, we have the privilege of a safe place to worship and even though we're not able to gather in that space right now because of everything that's happening around us, we know that our freedom to practice our faith is protected by the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And yet, the cultural expectation is that we keep our faith as nothing more than a private matter, as something personal that has little bearing on the rest of life. And I wonder, 
what kind of resistance will we face if we are bold in the way that we live out our faith? And how have we been timid in responding to the opportunities that God has provided us to be ambassadors of the gospel of Jesus? Well, as Christians were kept out of the synagogue, they faced a third and final challenge. Not long after the great earthquake, Philadelphia was rebuilt. But this time the money came from the Roman Empire. And the funding came at a cost, not of money, but of allegiance. And the residents of the city found themselves indebted to the empire. In exchange for reconstruction money, they promised to be loyal to Rome. And this meant serving the empire and worshipping Caesar. And as soon as Christians lost their home in the synagogue, they were all on their own, with no protections. Jews were exempt from worshipping the emperor, but Christians were not. They were persecuted for their unwillingness to bend the knee to Caesar. Well, today we are not ruled by some mighty emperor who demands worship and loyalty. And yet, Aren't there so many idols, so many false gods that compete for our allegiance? And they are so compelling in their persuasion, and they promise us the good life, but they leave us dissatisfied. Well, I have to say that one of the benefits for me in these past couple of weeks has been the time to step back and to reflect on my spiritual life. That with lots of fear happening all around me, that I've asked myself, in who or in what do I put my trust? And is it with the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, or is it with some idol or some false god? Well, to the church in Philadelphia, this congregation struggling to survive, this faithful group committed to following Jesus no matter what. The Lord speaks words of encouragement. Hold on. Well, this is also the church to which Jesus says in verse 8, See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. Theologians have long struggled to understand what Jesus is talking about, and some suggest that he is highlighting his special relationship with this congregation, that yes, they may no longer have had a safe place to worship, but that's not what matters most. What's most important is that Jesus is the one who holds the key of David, which means that he is the fulfillment of the promised king, and he is the one who is opening up the door into the fullness of God's presence. And there is nothing that can take that away. Well, others believe that Jesus is referring to the specific opportunities that he provides to believers to share the gospel message. And all of us understand that an open door is a symbol of opportunity. There's nobody that forces us to walk through. We can't fully see what's on the other side. That sometimes there's more than one door to choose from at the same time. That walking through one door might mean that we can't walk through another. And perhaps Jesus is alluding to both of these possibilities. Because it's only as we're secure in our relationship with him that we can have the courage to take steps of faith. And it's only as we trust in him that we can discern when it's right to walk through a door and when it's better to wait patiently. But what we do know is that despite the challenges faced by the church in Philadelphia, that Jesus continued to provide them with opportunities. And their ability to keep taking steps of faith is a testimony to their trust in the one who continued to be faithful to them. Every congregation has a story of how God has called them to be his people. And the same is true for us here at Fredericton CRC. That we have humble beginnings, just a few families seeking to form a fellowship of believers. And God continues to bless us with joyful 
worship, meaningful fellowship, and opportunities to grow and to serve. And, and we have faced our share of joys and challenges over the years, and yet God has been faithful to us. And now as we arrive at week three of not gathering together for worship or ministries, we're really beginning to sense how much we're missing out on. That it's a gift to worship together in one space, to talk about life over a cup of coffee, and to serve each other in many different ways. And like the church in Philadelphia, we've also faced our share of challenges. That since our beginnings after the Second World War, we've experienced loss and tragedy. We've contended with broken relationships and challenging circumstances. Our complexion as a congregation is also different. That over the years we've said goodbye to some longtime members. We've also welcomed new people into our midst. And yet God continues to remain present with us as he calls us to be his people in this place. Well, as we continue to look back, and as we continue to look ahead, what opportunities is God presenting us at this time in our history? As I've talked with some of you over the last couple of weeks or kept up on, on social media, I've discovered that even this unexpected break from our many commitments is an opportunity. It's provided us with much needed time to rest and to reconnect with family, with friends, and with loved ones. Others of us have had to scale back our work and our commitments. It's opened up doors for us to serve our neighbors. Still others have learned to live more fully in the present, to be thankful for God's daily provisions, that this time has helped us to slow down and to receive what each day has in store for us. We've learned to hold on to our plans and to hold on to our dreams much more lightly. But it's also been an opportunity for us to grow in our faith, to flex our spiritual muscle as we face this unprecedented crisis. It seems that one of the reasons we neglect our relationship with God is because we're always so busy. Well, isn't this a perfect opportunity to renew our commitment to past disciplines? Well, even stepping back from regular worship and the running of ministries is an opportunity. And don't get me wrong, it's also disappointing. But whether we were counting on it or not, many of us are getting a Sabbath from being busy with so many things, including our ministry commitments. So what opportunities is God presenting to you right now in the midst of this strange season of life shutting down all around you? And though many of us have been cooped up with extra time on our hands, well, others of you have been very hard at work, that you've never had to work so hard in your lives as you have in the past couple of weeks. And this may be just the beginning. The things may become only more challenging. And by being a part of the effort to respond to this crisis, you've been given opportunities to share the hope of the gospel through your words and through your actions. The letter to the church in Philadelphia ends with a promise. That Jesus says, those who are victorious... I will make pillars in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God. But Jesus uses an image that was common in that day. William Barclay explains that a special custom took place in Philadelphia any time that a new temple was constructed, that to honor its exemplary citizens, the main pillars supporting the temple structure would be inscribed with the names of important individuals civic leaders, exceptional athletes, leading academics, or respected philosophers. And so everybody who entered the temple complex, the first thing they would see would be these names on display. 
And maybe this practice is not so different from the way that certain public buildings or spaces around our city are named after recognized individuals. And in the same way, Jesus promises his disciples that they too will be recognized as they follow his lead in ministry. That as challenging as the work may be, it has lasting value. It really matters. And as a congregation here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, we give thanks for the way that God has been faithful to us in the past. And in the midst of this season of stepping back from so many of life's commitments, what opportunities does God have in store for us as we look to the future? What opportunities is he presenting to us as individuals and as a body of believers even in this coming week as we seek to discern his call in our lives? May we humbly acknowledge our dependence on him as the one who opens doors and invites us to enter in. Let's pray. We give thanks, O oh God, for these words written so many years ago to a congregation in Asia Minor, a small congregation, a fellowship with few resources. And yet, Lord, you worked great and mighty things through them. Lord, we pray that we would see in the same way the way that you are at work among us. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to grow in our love and trust for you. And Lord, we acknowledge your deep desire to draw us in to an even fuller and a more meaningful connection with you. And Lord, out of that relationship, we pray that you would also deepen our longing to discern the opportunities that you have in store for us. And Lord, even in the midst of this incredible time in the history of the world where so many things are shutting down, where so many people are stepping back from a regular routine. Help us to see the opportunities that you're presenting to us as individuals and as a church community. And even as we look ahead, uncertain of what exactly the future holds, we pray too that you would continue to uh, provide us with a vision for how you are calling us as your people in this place at this time to love you and to serve you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to respond together with song. And we're going to sing together one of the very familiar and much loved modern hymns, In Christ Alone.
It's been so good to worship again together this morning, uh, to gather in God's presence from the many different places that we uh, are at this point. Uh, and we know that as we do that, God will go with us as we go into this week. And even the uncertainty of this week, we know that he is faithful. And God leaves us with these words of blessing. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with you always. Amen.